Hello, everybody. It's so exciting to see people here. Um, I'm not sure if this is one of those um, platforms where people are populating, so we'll just talk for a minute to give everyone a chance to get settled in, but welcome. Um, we're excited to see you here this evening for my friend, Dr. Elizabeth Cohen's book reading. Um, I'll introduce us. My name is Susan Guthrie, and um, I am the subsidiary here. I'm just here to talk with my friend, Dr. Elizabeth Cohen, about her book, Light on the Other Side of Divorce. Uh, this is Dr. Elizabeth Cohen, who's here with me. You see her on the screen to the right. Say hi, Dr. Elizabeth. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. Excited for Barbara's Bookstore. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, we're, we're this is um, such a fun thing that we get to do. We were talking about this not long ago, um, about the fact that when your book premieres during the pandemic, this is your your book events are, are all online, but it's kind of fun because you get to meet people from all over the place. Yeah, it's really nice. I mean, just thinking about the all the people here from Barbara's bookstores who've come and you being in Chicago and being part of it. It's, it's so, I know it's so, it's like perfect. There's the skyline. It's, I was just that you can kind of see the Willis tower. It's behind the thing there, but I tried, yeah, I was I trying to get my it. Chicago skyline out there. So yeah. um, I can share with my fellow Chicagoans. Yeah. Who are here. It's so great. And I, I'm so happy to be here with you, Susan. I mean, as such a world renowned, mediator and um, divorce attorney and, you know, host of the amazing Divorce and Beyond podcast, you are just have your pulse on everything divorce. So I'm so grateful that you were willing to be here today and have this conversation with me and the, the audience about this really important topic that we know has been really stigmatized. Yeah. Well, and that's actually how you and I met um, over this, uh, this shared belief that it has been stigmatized and it is something that we need to try to break that stigma and start normalizing not the experience of divorce, the emotions of divorce, and most importantly, the healing process from divorce um, so that people can thrive as you, as you help them do with your book um, to find the light you know, beyond after and beyond divorce. So um, for everyone who has not met Dr. Elizabeth, she is a um, clinical psychologist and the CEO of her um, own practice in New York City. Although you work with clients, I know all, all over the United States. Um, and you also have a wonderful program called Afterglow. Um, and that Afterglow is kind of what built up into creating the book for you, I think. Um, and you realized and learned so much with and um, helped the people in your Afterglow program that you wanted to reach out, I think, and help more people. So um, it's exciting to be here because we are, we're coming up on a year from when the book launched. It launched in April 2020, right? Yep, that's right. So what what type of, just tell me a little bit before we get into um, your reading, I was just wondering what type of feedback are you, what are you hearing from readers? Um, wow. I mean, one of the most powerful experiences for me now is getting comments and notes from readers. I recently got one where someone said that when I opened your book, um, I noticed the tears were streaming down my eyes because I felt so heard and seen and understood. You know, I think we, we we talk about this a lot, Susan, between you and I and our and our amazing cohort of um, people who are fighting for a positive divorce, that so many people still feel ashamed. They still feel like it's um, a sign of weakness, of failure, having been divorced. And I think when they hear someone who, like my story, where I have so much experience in mental health and in positive coping and making things through that even I could share my pain and struggle and heal through it. I think it's very reassuring um, that they aren't alone. And I think that I really, in writing this book, I really dug deep. I mean, there were times, and um, I've said this to you before, where I had to stop writing because it was really resonating how painful my experience was. So I really let all my feelings be present in this book. And so I think when people say that they feel seen and heard, I think it's from that vulnerability that I put in the book. 
And I'm really grateful because as a clinical psychologist, we're really taught not to be vulnerable, not to share anything. I mean, you know, Freudian, I mean, I wasn't a Freudian therapist, but you're supposed to be like a blank slate and not even have any photos of yourself. And you really shouldn't even have your diplomas. And so here I am telling, opening my heart and to see the impact it's had on people has been really, really powerful. Um, I've also loved how people have used the book. So some, there was a couple women who together went on a, like a weekend retreat and worked through the book together as practices together. I love yeah. that. So oh my kind God, of what an amazing this idea. Kind of, like they created this retreat where they could support each other. And you know, I always say like, we're only as sick as our secrets and we're so much sicker when we're alone. So coming together as a team, as a group and working on it has been really powerful. So just those are the, some of the things that um, have really resonated with me and when people have said. Well, that, I, I love that retreat idea. I mean, that is something that honestly, anybody who's listening, if you have friends who are going through this, because that, you know, what you just said that you are not alone that uh, that is what we hear from everyone that they that they feel in that moment um, of the difficult emotions in the process and they feel that it's a failure and they feel that uh, you know their their world is being upended and the future is this I always call it the big black hole because it's yeah. no longer something they know but they do feel alone and I think that's the big surprise about your book um, because you do it's it's not just a therapist sitting down and walking through the steps of how to heal. It is very much informed by your own personal journey. And you do go deep and you do share um, a lot of your personal stories. And it's, it's you know, I see you here smiling. We talk, we're friends. Um, but you've been, you know, you went through a lot during that yeah. experience. Um, yeah. You do know what people are going through. Yeah, definitely. And then, should, I, should I read some of that? Because I think that's the part I was going to read was a little bit of that. I, I was just going to say that's, you know, that's one of the things that I think stays with people so much. So I'd love to hear what are you going to share with us? Yeah, I'm going to read a portion from the book um, about my experience. That's on page 20. Okay. <clears throat> so this is what I'm talking about going through the my through my divorce. Um, if you knew me during that time, you would never have known anything was wrong. I hid all the gruesome details and only shared the positive stories from the first half of my day. I never shared my pain, fear, or anger with anyone. I believe that this was my problem, referring to my, my ex-husband's drinking, to change and fix. And if I told other people, then they would see how out of control I was they would think that I could not manage the situation. I was determined to figure out how to fix my marriage, fix him, and fix our situation. I really thought I could do it. After all, I had been fixing things my whole life. So imagine how I felt when I was faced with the deep truth that I could not fix this man. I could not heal his drinking disease I could not find a way for him to commit to and be in our family in a healthy, sober way. I did not give up easily though. I tried all the things I could. I just could not accept that I could not fix this. Truly, that was my mistake. That was what I contributed to the end of our relationship, my resistance to let him and the relationship go. I did not wanna let go. My determination to hold tight became more about me trying to be successful rather than trying to help him. I recall a mentor at the time saying, figuring it out is not a solution. In this, it, figuring out is not a solution in this situation, but letting go is. I really did not wanna hear that, but somewhere deep inside, I knew this to be true. I could only let go of the relationship when he put one of the children at risk and I found the courage to kick him out. I felt angry, scared, overwhelmed, broken, unmoored and shattered. I did not know who I was without my marriage and the life I was leaving behind. I had spent years building that life and in what felt like an instant, it was all over. I could not imagine a future or even the next day my relationship was excruciatingly, pain, excruciatingly painful, and I felt somewhere deep inside 
that it was all my fault. I was tortured with my thoughts. I was walking around the city I live in like a zombie. If you were to see me at the playground with my kids, you would have thought I was having a fine time as I had learned over the years married to an alcoholic to pretend that I was okay. Inside, I was a mess. I was sad, scared, and ashamed. One cold winter day in New York City, I was pushing the kids in an unwieldy double stroller, trying to get around the pedestrians without pissing them off too much. I walked by a store window. I turned to look at my reflection and was stopped in my tracks. There in the corner of the window was a jewelry box with script writing on it in a gorgeous shade of purple. There was something about this object that was so compelling to me. The phrase etched on the box read, just when the caterpillar thought life was over, it became a butterfly. I felt chills all over my body and began to tear up. I went into the store and bought that box. I didn't believe this quote and couldn't imagine how it would help me, but I knew I had to have a reminder of this possibility around me. As a problem solver, I quickly started looking for solutions. One evening, once our kids had gone to bed, thank goodness, and with two glasses of champagne, another recently divorced girlfriend and I started Googling support groups and retreats for divorced women. We were so desperate for answers and guidance. We felt like starving animals searching for their next meal. We wanted to relieve the pressure of feeling like such failures. We were searching for compassion, support, and skills to handle what was coming. We wanted a community to help us feel less ashamed and less alone. We were hoping for knowledge of what to expect with co-parenting, dating, friends, and our senses of selves. Believe it or not, we found nothing. We could not find a comprehensive program anywhere. But given my problem-solving attitude, I got to piecing together a healing program for myself using my clinical knowledge and honestly pure willpower. Slowly, very slowly, and with many ups and downs, my life went from dark to light. I felt in my bones the quote I had seen being that day in the store, I was becoming a butterfly. Getting to the light ushered in more transformation than I ever thought possible. I have shifted and grown in many ways I never knew was possible. I know myself, my motivations, my weaknesses, my fears, and my growing edges better than I ever have. Through all the healing and digging into myself, I found a life I never dreamed of having. I discovered my true worth and I found myself actually feeling grateful for my divorce. Now I have a loving 11 year marriage, a good relationship with my ex-husband, ease with co-parenting, a strong sense of myself and my needs, a thriving business and nurturing relationships with friends and family. As I sit here and reflect and write about how I felt 10 years ago, 11 years ago now, tears are welling up in my eyes. I feel deeply sad for that terrified, overwhelmed, and desperate young woman. I want to jump back in time and hug her and reassure her that life will get better. She will live through the pain and she will thrive. Short of getting a time machine, I'm writing this book and have created the Afterglow Method to a Wonderful Life Post-Divorce to help those of you who feel like I did. I wrote this book for you. I wrote this book for the moments when life feels unbearable. I wrote this book for the instant when you want to simply give up. I wrote this so you know you're not alone, you're not to blame, and you're able to have deep growth, change, and abundance. If you read this book and try the exercises, you will see change. You will feel different. You will feel a positive shift in your life and your attitude. People in your life will comment that you look different. You'll get more sleep, feel at ease, and have more hope. Please join me on this beautiful ride. <laughs> I love that. And you're right. It just touched on our conversation entirely, what we were just talking about before you were reading. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. You know, we've both been there. We've both been on, uh, in that space that you were writing from there. Um, thank you, Chicago said beautiful. It really was beautiful and it's so heartfelt, um, especially because I know you and I know that you, you really came from a place of wanting people to know they weren't alone and to have hope. 
And yeah. as you said, without a time machine, I always say to the clients, I wish I had a crystal ball to show you that the yeah. future is, is going to be better, that this difficult time will bring about change, but can also bring about great opportunities. And you just said that, right? Look where you are in your life today. Yeah. And it's because of that. It's, it's really, and, and you and I have talked about this a lot that, you know, I had this moment of choice that I talk about in the book too, where I had a lot of stories, you know, being married to someone who struggles with substance use disorder. Um, there were a lot of brutal stories and I could have just kind of spent my life focusing on those and sharing those and feeling sorry for myself. There was a lot of pity to be had, but then I, but I realized that that was going to get me nowhere. And so I gently, compassionately and lovingly had to ask myself, how did I end up here? Like what's going on for me? And as a therapist, you can imagine it's, I'm so drawn to figure out, oh, what's going on for you and what's happening with you? And how, as I said, like, how do I fix you? But there is this opportunity to take this pain and figure out how do I make sure something like this doesn't happen to me again, because I am the one who has control over me. And we both met in our work, people who are still so stuck, right, on what has the other person did to them. And look, yeah. none of us, we all play a role. It's 50-50 and humans are difficult to be with. So like we all play our role. <laughs> and so the so in my in my work, the sooner you can own what, what you bring to the table, the faster you can heal. Yeah. And that's so poignant when I hear you say that about people who are still stuck in the space um, of, you know, I talk to people all the time about yeah. divorce and they will tell me the story of their divorce and what, what was done to them, what, you know, what happened, why it was somebody else's fault. And then they will drop into the conversation that it was seven years ago, yeah. 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And it's, it's actually one of the saddest moments because it's a person whose life stopped yes them. and yes. they've never moved beyond that yeah. and you had that perfect storm i mean you had uh, your now ex-husband did struggle or does struggle uh, with substance um, use disorder and we know that bad things might happen or difficult things to deal with um, it would be easy to slide into a space of this i had nothing to do with this i did everything that i could to try yeah and and resolve it but that doesn't move you forward in your no. life and i want to also talk a little bit for anyone who's listening who has a partner who has struggled with substance use disorder you know i also really had to not interfere with my kids process of what was happening you know i really wanted to protect them and you know this as a you know working as an attorney divorce attorney like you can overstep like I was like, I just never want him to see them. Like period, end of story, never do anything with them, right? Like, and even without substance use disorder, a lot of um, parents feel that way. Like he's a crappy parent or they're a crappy parent. I don't want to do this. And I had to push myself. I, I talk in the book about how I, have, I had a mentor at the time who said, you know, it's like, I'm too afraid to have him take them on the subway. This is when he had already gotten some sobriety. And she said, you, you, you have to let yourself think about what you're afraid of, sit with that fear, allow yourself to know that if God forbid something happened, like you would move through it. You cannot control his relationship with them. And if you do, they will end up resenting you way more than they'll ever resent him. I mean, I have clients, I'm sure you have this too, who say to me, but what am I going to, how, I got to tell the kids that he's a narcissist, or I got to tell the kids that he's fill in the blank. They deserve to know. Right. I deserve, and I, yeah. exactly. They need to know. And I say, they will know. If you provide them with a, an example of what real, validated, connected, nurtured love is, they will naturally know that's not what they're getting. But zip your lip. It is not your business to tell your children anything about that other person. And honestly, when you're going through a divorce, any anytime you notice yourself focusing on the other person, try to bring the focus back to yourself. I had that experience. I think I share in the book, I went to see a psychiatrist because I was so 
depressed. I, I wasn't having active suicidal thoughts, but I thought to myself, I get why somebody would kill themselves. So I thought, oh God, I got to get on some medication. I went to a psychiatrist and I just started telling the story and he was like, stop, like stop mentioning his name. Like, tell me about you. And I sat there dumbfounded and I thought, I don't know, like I'm the wife, you know, whatever, or I'm the mother. And he's like, no, but what about you? And that was so powerful because the changes and the, the realizations I, and the work I had to do on myself have helped me, as I said in the book, in all parts of my life. It wasn't just about this one friggin' relationship. Like it was about how I am in the world. Like I, 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 I was in that relationship, how I am, how I was in all relationships, relationship to myself, relationship to work. Right. And so I needed to shift all of that. And now things are so much clearer and I'm grateful for the divorce um, for bringing me there. I know you've talked about that too. Yeah. I mean, that's actually, we, we talked about it. One of the things I wanted to mention is you also have a, a podcast, the divorce <laughs> doctor podcast that is a um, comes at discussions with people who have gone through divorce to tell their stories of divorce so that people know they're not alone, right? That what, going back to that beginning. And it was just making me think, I, I was lucky enough to be a guest on your show. And it was the first time that I, who am always talking about divorce and the law about divorce and how to mediate your divorce and what my clients think about divorce. But it was the first time someone had asked me questions about my experience of my divorce. And, you know, that was a really interesting conversation for me because it was sort of that same thing. I had always looked at a divorce as this construct of something that I do in my, my world. It's my career, not of who I was within the world of that, that experience. Mm -hmm. And that's much, again, what you're sharing in the book, which I, it had to be you know, you, you mentioned sometimes you had to set the book aside and, and stop writing because it was, you know, just going a little too deep in that moment. But I, was there a catharsis as well for you in, in putting it down on paper, knowing it was going to help other people? Definitely. I mean, as I was reading that, there was also a deep tenderness to, to me, to, to, the, to the younger me. Yeah. Um, and in my podcast, I always ask at the end what people would go back and what like loving gesture they would say. Um, so it feels kind of like a like in some ways. I mean, I I, I will tell you who I wrote this book for, um, which is for the I always say like the parent like I was who was like covered in spit going to the free library, you know, free reading hour at the library. I had seen out of the corner of my eye a book that said light at the other side of divorce it was possible. That would have been amazing, you know, for the people who like me just felt so overwhelmed and couldn't find any information. But as we're sitting here talking and I haven't thought of this before, Susan, like this is also like a love letter to me, to me back then, you know, that I actually did make it through. Um, because even today, it's still hard to believe I made it through because it was so challenging. And um, my children were very young. They were six months and two years old, and now they're 14 and 16. And as they're getting older and getting ready to transition out of the house, that time is coming back to me about how incredibly challenging it was. And so I just want to say to people also, we've talked about this every time we do a podcast together, like every week I'm on, I'm on, I'm like feeling another layer of my healing of the divorce, right? Like now I'm like, oh, this is this, them thinking about college is bringing up my not being with my partner and what that would be like. And I mean, my ex-partner, like it's just, it's an ongoing process. And if you're willing to be aware of what's going on for you, you can keep learning. Like the grief in particular, there's a chapter in my book about grief and loss, about grieving the relationship. That, and I wonder if you feel this way, Susan, that's an ongoing process. That just continues. It's not like, I mean, you don't want to get back together with your ex and it's over and you're past it. But the grief of the relationship, that just for me keeps kind of popping up at different times. Yeah, I think that's it's such an interesting thought and, and so true for people. First, I think because with any difficult 
um, experience. We just want it to be over. Like we want to believe that we're going to get somewhere, shut a door on that and move on. And you're right. Things will pop up. I mean, I've been divorced now for 20 years, I think. Um, so quite a lot and remarried for, for 12 with my husband, my husband for a very long time. Um, but still things will pop up, you know, still things will come up from that time. And it's not, you, you mentioned grief. I love that, uh, that, you know, acknowledgement. It's not grief so much as it's a, um, like an echo coming back from the past of, of something. Oh, we were just traveling and we were in a place that I used to travel to with my ex-husband and we passed a restaurant where I had spent a New Year's Eve and, and you get those little like echoes from the past, you know, yeah. that come back at you at times. Yeah. And, you know, Susan, I'm glad you're bringing this up because it, it, what I think of as a therapist is the goal is to be able to integrate information and to not, um, push out or be rigid. Um, we want generally our nervous system to be flowing, open, malleable. So that's how we um, become really resilient. So something happens, we ride the wave, and then we go back to what we're doing. And so a memory comes back like that, or we're planning this family vacation, and I realize that it's very similar to my honeymoon. <laughs> Which one? My first honeymoon. Well, I didn't yeah. have a second honeymoon yet. So this is, but my first one. And so I thought, oh, wow, how interesting. And then it was, and then I was starting to have some memories from the trip. And I thought, you know, and a lot of people that I work with, will be like, I don't want to think about that. That's over. Why am I thinking? And push it away. And we always say, you and I, that like, if you push something down, it comes out sideways. So let me just bring that in. And then I was like, you know, that was a, that was actually a really nice trip. That was a really, and, and it actually got me, and I have children with my ex, so it was really good because one of the things I always talk about is you want to show the kids that there was love there. And Absolutely. so I got to say, like, I can't wait to take you on this trip that your father and I went on. That was really, really fun, um, spending some time in the jungle and then in the city, and then we're going to, and um, and then telling some memories about it. And it really is very integrating for me and very, very integrating for the kids. Such a significant is that you're talking about this because parents who, who separate and go separate ways will tend to co-parent, but will start to deny the past, right? To the children. Yeah. We're going to sort of have their history erased. And I, it was brought home to me very poignantly just this past weekend, we were mm. in a place as I mentioned, traveling where I used to go with my um, ex-husband, but it also is a place where my current husband lived with his ex-wife. Mm. And we were walking down the beach and my stepson was with us and we passed a place and my stepson pointed it out. He's like, oh, I had lunch there. And my husband said, oh, take a picture of it and send it to your mom. She and I used to go there all the time. And my stepson, who's 24 years old and right, not... Um, not a little kid, but it was, you know, he took a picture with his phone. He texted it to his mom. It reminded him that his parents had a history yeah. and yeah. it was wonderful for him. Yes. And, and I can tell him some stories. It was lovely. Exactly. And I can feel it as you say it, this like calming. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not a child of a divor divorce, but like just this like, oh, it's okay. in some ways what you're saying is it's okay to love us both. Yeah. Yep. Right. You can love us both and you can even miss when we were together. I mean, that all of the feelings are okay. And the more we allow ourselves to be okay with feelings, the, the faster we're going to heal because healing is all about being okay with whatever feeling comes up. Yeah. Well, and to circle back to the book, yeah. that's actually... The beauty of the book, um, you know, I, I mean, I've read the book several times. I give it to all my clients um, and friends and people I know going through this process because what is special about your book? Um, and, and honestly, I get sent books about divorce you know, all, <laughs> all the time. What is special about your book is that you, you mix in your personal story, your personal journey, very deep, you know, very deeply felt and, and revealing. You also have experiences from all of the people that you've helped over the years. 
And then really significantly, and I would imagine this is what really appealed to the ladies who took the book on a retreat, is you have exercises that are actionable steps to walk people through the healing. Because as we just talked about, it's wonderful to get to a point where you can be okay with honoring your past while having moved forward, allowing your children still to have the history while you are help, but you have to heal before you can get there. And the book does that. It, it resonates to your personal experience of where you're at so you know you're not alone, but then also gives you the concrete steps to move through. Yeah. And I really, I know I also, I wrote this book because there are a lot of people now, I was doing a lot of this work for myself, but also with clients in my practice. And psychotherapy, especially in New York, is exorbitantly expensive. And I knew that, you know, divorce really impacts people financially. And so I wanted people in, in some ways to have kind of like a pocket therapy for moving through this, like the women who did the retreat. And so you're actually right, absolutely right. I combined my expertise in cognitive behavioral therapy and somatic experiencing trauma work in mindfulness-based stress reduction, lots of psychotherapeutic research-supported techniques so that people can move through this. And someone was telling me um, that they got it. They didn't go through a divorce, but they went through another loss and they were able to use the tools to move through it. And, you know, I was just saying today to someone that, you know, I, and I've talked, we've talked about this a lot, like change and shifting is not some sort of like magic pill, magic diet, magic guru, magic meditation. It is one moment at a time practicing micro changes over time. Like shifting and changing is just a ton of small little shifts. And this book really gives you cognitive approaches, behavioral approaches, emotional approaches, some hypnotic approaches that you can do and integrate into your daily life so that you can start to heal. And I still do all the tools in this. It's not like there's <laughs> so it's not like I stopped. You know, there is no stopping to this because this is how you manage moving through the world. I mean, the book could be, a, you know, a guide to man man walking through the world when difficult things happen, which we all, you know, we all need. Yeah. Well, because it's true, right? Difficult things are going to happen. There is no charmed life. And, and it's, you're a hundred percent correct. I find myself hearing Dr. Elizabeth in my, <laughs> um, in my head or seeing a page in your book and saying, you know, this is a moment in time where I have to go outside and put my feet in the, in the grass. Now can't do that right now here in Chicago, not a lot of grass. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, you know, there are little tips and tricks yeah. and, and longer exercises and more involved exercises. It really runs the gamut. Mm -hmm. um, but you've really done a beautiful job of tying it all together, yeah. um, walking yeah. people through those steps. And, you know, one of the things that's really stayed with me from reading the book, and, and I was long past my divorce by the time I, I had the benefit of reading your book. So for me, it, it was more it was more the life journey. Um, but you know, the journaling aspect as well, um, there's, I know everyone thinks, oh, journaling, journaling, you know, that, that's something you hear all the time, such an incredibly helpful tool. It's, it's hard to overestimate how important it is. Yeah. You know, we live a lot in our, our minds and we, have people living in there rent free. And we spend a lot of time ruminating and problem solving, thinking worrying is problem solving. And the journal exercises that I have really try to get to the core of, you know, what is your belief and what evidence do we have to support it? And, and what can you be doing a little differently? Like one of my, you know, one of the chapters talks about self-care. And I feel like self-care is something that a lot of people, you know, it's like a term. It's like self-love. It's yeah. kind of a way. Right. right, exactly. It's like a, this global thing. And I talk about in, in, you know, specific things. Like I feel like saying no is a way of doing self-care. Probably one of the most important. Exactly. Asking for help. Right. So these these setting boundaries, like so really kind of concrete um, tools. So, for example, with um, asking for help, there's a section in the book where I have you write down like all the tasks you do. 
the ones you love, the ones you hate, and then ask yourself, does this have to be done at all? Does this have to be done by me? Does this have to be done in a certain order? Like really get really clear on crossing stuff off, pruning things. You know how much, especially women, um, um, you know, historically do things they either don't want to be doing, right? Or aren't even any good at just because we feel this obligation to do it. And so really self-care is also about self-empowerment. And I heard this great um, thing the other day, which is that the opposite of selfish is actually self-full, not selfless. Like no one wants to be less of self. You want to be more of self. Or more you. More you. Somehow through all of what you were just saying, I'm thinking, does this mean I don't have to do laundry anymore? (laughs) Yes. Because if that's what you mean here. Yes. It I'm writing that down. The things that don't light you up are taking away a, a, a place for you that you could be either helping others or helping yourself. And we do. We have this, this feeling of, well, I have to be doing this. I should be doing this. Other people have it worse than me. You know, I really challenge those kinds of thinking because no one is happy if you are acting like the martyr. I mean, that was a huge part of my, in my relationship that I was the martyr. So he was hurting me and I was the martyr. Um, he might've had the, he has the substance use disorder, but I was making him feel like a piece of crap because I was always talking about all the terrible things he was doing to me. So martyrdom is horrible. It's like, they have this thing, like the bunch of ends, like mother, mothering, martyrdom, managing, like all these things that are just like, you think make you a good partner and they ruin the relationship. And so really, again, I had to look and and say like, wow, I was really acting like a martyr. I was really trying to manage. I was really trying to mother an adult. Like that was never my job. And to give someone the dignity to be who they are, even if it means we're not going to be together. Right. If they are going to be themselves, but you doesn't mean you have to be with them. Right. And I think one of the cruxes, and if people have any questions, feel free to put them in the questions. Um, We're happy to answer them. Um, One of the biggest questions I get, or the the theme that I get a lot is, you know, how do I get this person to change? Um, Or this person, I'm sure you get, you know, I mean, as an attorney, how do I put in my divorce agreement that they'll never blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you can't. We can put it in there, doesn't right. It, right? We put right. it, we call it aspirational language in the agreements. Right. I Neither party that. shall speak poorly of the other in front of the children. Right. Right. But, but you can't stop them from doing it. Right. And you have to, and letting go of control and letting go of resentment. I have a chapter in my book about letting go of resentment. And the way that I really encourage people to do that is to start thinking about that other person who they're divorcing as a whole being who has lots of lots of different characteristics, some really lovely ones and some not so lovely ones, but you know who also has some lovely ones and not so lovely ones? You. So we're just two humans trying to get through. And the question is, what do you put your attention on? So in the book, I suggest trying to find three memories with your ex that actually remind you of their goodness. So this was why this is so great. This trip came up for me because it really did remind me like it was an adventure. It was really fun. He's really a fun, curious guy. That was that really lit me up. Also, because I spent a lot of time with him like Right. You were, I was married to him for quite a bit. I was dating him for quite a bit. Like, and I'm not an idiot. So there must've been a reason I was there. So it just, I think finding compassionate things about your ex doesn't mean, again, you want to get back together with them. Doesn't mean they didn't do anything painful, but it means that they're just human. And if they're just, if you're just two humans, you must know that, you know, from your work, like you can just negotiate everything you can do better because you're not in that hypervigilant attacking phase where you can't make any good decisions. Where everything is an argument and everything is conflict. Right. Unfortunately, you know, with with that cycle, the conflict cycle, you're just gonna keep yourself there. 
because yeah. it's, you know, one person attacks the other human nature is they're just going to attack back yeah. and you're just going to keep going. Exactly. Around. Exactly. And, you know, we need uh, a lot of change in this world. We all know that. Right. And holding on to the backpack, you know, having a backpack filled with rage and anger at your ex is going to keep you from being able to make the amazing changes and shifts that you're meant to in the world. Like, I believe that every person has this amazing capacity to shift and, and make a change. It might be globally, it might be in your home, it might be in your community. But if you're bogged down with that rage and that resentment, you can't live to your, your life's purpose, whatever that is. Like, I promise you, I for myself, I think about this a lot. When I was in my marriage trying to manage it, trying to get my ex-husband sober, I had this really small office in my practice. I was like, this is enough. I'll stay really small. I never could have imagined expanding my, my business in the way that it has because I was so busy managing him and the relationship. But once I let go of that, there was all this space for me, for me to grow. And so it's for you. I mean, for those of you who are listening, who are going through this, like you might think that having the best settlement, um, getting the house, like that, that's the best, that's the best thing for you out of this. As Susan and I have talked about it, that's a short term thing. Yeah. Like there is a long term, um, gain you can get from letting go of the resentment, putting the focus on you and working through yourself because it's you, you change and you take you everywhere you go. The house will get run down. You can always be there with your new understanding about yourself. Yeah. Well, the magic is in turning the focus on yourself. And so for many, many people, you know, for you, when you describe all that micromanaging and trying to yeah. control and mothering you were doing, you were, there's no time in that. You also, by the way, had a six month old and a, a two year old, right? There's no time in that for, for shining a light on yourself fulfilling your own needs. And that's actually, I say this to clients all the time that divorce is, you know, not a tragedy. It's an opportunity and it truly is. But the opportunity comes when you, when you shine the light on yourself, yes. when you grow and move forward through that. And that's not going to happen by staying focused on what the other person did wrong or that resentment. It is truly in looking at yourself and starting to align your new life with 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 what works for you, and you may not even know what that is. You will after we do the exercises. Yeah, the exactly. The book can help you with that. And yeah. I want I want to say too that you're absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, and I just wanted to say this before we finish that while this is is an opportunity, it's such a huge opportunity. And I encourage people. I have a chapter in my book about friends and who to reach out to, and you need. Um, lots of different kinds of people. You need cheerleaders who just believe in you 100%. And you need way showers, people who will show you the way. And my book is one way shower. And Susan's podcast and her private podcast group is a huge way to get support on all areas of divorce. And so part of the opportunity is for you to lean on those of us who've gone through it and who can provide the support to lean on people who really believe in you and to not be alone. And if you're listening now, we are in an ice, we are in a pandemic of isolation and add to that the trauma of divorce and the trauma of, please like lean on people, lean on us, reach out for our resources. Um, I have a membership group with women who are always supporting each other. Um, we have Kate Anthony, our dear friend, has a membership group. Like we have all these people who have amazing opportunities. Don't do it alone. Lean on us. You can heal, but it's very hard to do it alone. So I just wanted to say that before we finish. Wonderful and beautiful thought because there are those of us who've been out there who have had our personal lives intersect with our professional lives. And what we've tried to do is create a community that will help others as they go through this process, because we know all sides of, of this. So, um, I, you know, honestly, the book is, is a wonderful place to start your journey forward. So many people get stuck in the past 
or stuck yeah. in the moment of pain right now as they're going through the divorce process, start your journey forward with the book. Start your journey into your new future, or as I say, your beyond. You know, yes. So. <laughs> yes, I love that. Thank you. Yeah. Very so cool. I know there's a code um, for 10% off and a link to get the book. Um, if you use the coupon code event, you'll get 10% off and it's right there, Barbara's bookstore. Um, please support Barbara's and, and buy the book through them. Um, and uh, I know you can reach out to Dr. Elizabeth. Can I, can I tell people your website? The, yeah, I'll put it in the chat as well. Perfect. Um, DrElizabethCohen.com. Uh, she's very easy to find. And listen to the Divorce Doctor podcast. Um, if you want to know that you're not alone, you'll hear stories from so many incredible people yeah. um, about what they went through. Yeah. So definitely reach out and listen. There's a lot of resources out there for you all. Yeah. Thank you so much, Susan, for being here and carrying on this really important conversation and carrying the torch with me um, in shifting how we think about divorce and focusing on the healing. That's what the, um, the podcast is all about, people sharing their stories of healing and moving through and growth. And I you know I started it because I wish I had that when I was going through it. Yeah. And the book. And so the book. thank you, everyone. And thank you, Barbara. Thank you so much. And thanks, Barbara, for having us.